Okay, we are doing troubles and trials, stumbling blocks or stepping stones with this here book that you can't see if you're on Zoom. Um, I've been having Jennifer um, read because last year during the gathering I had her read and I went, she shall become a reader. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she's always done a good, a good job. So and mainly she remembers where we left off, <laughs> which or or Mallory did because well, last week it was Mallory that saved the day, <laughs> and many other times. So if you'll come and let's just read a little bit. Can I read the last sentence that we read last time? That and is then, good. I okay. usually read the last paragraph, but you can, yeah. Do you want me to do that, or you want yeah, me to just do the sentence? it catches everybody yeah. up a lot better. Okay. If our memory serves correctly, the last paragraph we read last time is um, on page 14 for those who are following along. Time after time, God has shown that he will deliver us in time of need if we will only trust him. His ears are open to those who are afflicted. But what about those times when we turn to him for deliverance and there is no answer? Many, time, many would tell you that deliverance does not come because our faith is weak. At times this may be true. But even when Jesus would tell his followers that they had little faith or tell them to only believe, he would still perform the deliverance needed. He did this in spite of the fact that they were of little faith. So our next section is trust in spite of affliction. Many times we ask for deliverance as Paul did about his thorn in the flesh. We may fail to hear the answer, although we know that Paul heard, or God does not answer at all. What do we do then? Has God forsaken us? Is our faith too small? Once again, the answer is that there can be a definite advantage to these trials, but we must learn how to respond to them. Since we have learned that trials are not just external, but internal also, we may be able to see more clearly how God deals with us. When a trial comes our way, we usually respond to it by praying for deliverance. We pray that God will respond by taking the external affliction away. Examine the drawing on the next page. I don't know if that needs to be zoomed in or we can. He's the teacher, not me. Okay. Uh, it's got believer. And under believer, it's, there's a circle that says internal trials removed. And then it has on e either side arrows pointing in at the believer. And those arrows say afflictions, trials, and persecutions. But there are X's over those words because there are X's over the words. And it says external trials. Those are the external trials. And I guess they are no longer there because there's been deliverance. Is that what I'm supposed to understand in that? Okay. Um, you know, it is... We've all experienced this. Times that we prayed or we cried out um, under hard situations, under duress. And the Lord didn't seem to answer. And of course, a lot of times when we do that, we're expecting answers right away, right? I mean, that's not unusual. We're looking, to, that's why we're praying. But we need to remember that the Lord doesn't always operate on that level, that he has other things going on. Um, but if we don't know that, and when I say other things, not other people or whatever, I mean, he can handle the whole world's prayers, okay? <laughs> but, um, you know, if we don't know that, then we can get discouraged or we can, you know, stop believing in God, uh, which 
as I've said before, I've seen it many times that people have done that. And, uh, and in some cases, it, was, it wasn't because God never answered. It was because God didn't answer either in the time period they wanted it or God didn't answer them uh, with the answer that they wanted. And, um, you know, as I said, I've seen people leave the Lord because they didn't trust the Lord. And um, I would say that maybe one of the most important things in our prayer should be faith, should be trust, should be... It's not that we, we know He's going to do it, even. We can still have faith in him, whether he's going to do it or whether he's going to do it in my timing or not or whatever. I mean, the Lord is worth that. I mean, he's given us so much. Amen. He's given us so much. And uh, so in that, um, faith in him who sees when we don't see. Faith in him who knows when we really don't know. That's what faith is. That's what faith is. And um, so just, just to throw in this, well, what, you know, what if we pray and, and he doesn't either do it on, in our time period frame or he doesn't do it the way we wanted it to and we get mad at God and you know I don't know have any of you ever been really mad at God yeah, I have to I mean I, I shook my fist in his face I'm ashamed of it now <laughs> but I did and I'm in it <clears throat> But I learned something from it, and that was, he, he's looking at me, and he's going, he don't know. And, I'm, and of course, I'm going, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know? Um, he doesn't know. He hasn't walked in these areas before. Um, he's had no coaching and no whatever. So does that mean that I got upset that God turned his back and said, well, then that's it. No more love. No. You know, well, Lord, I don't love you if you're not going to. Well, that's okay. I love you. You know, that's okay. I love you. But what if you can't hear that, those words, I love you? Well, then it might take a few go-rounds for you to find out that no matter what happened, he has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's not changed his heart for you. He has not changed his care for you. He's still there. He's still there. And those things are, are important. They are. They're really important. And we all, again, if we hadn't all gone through them yet, we will. We will. But they teach us things about his character. You know, that he's faithful and true. It's going to be written on his vesture, you know, when he comes back on that white horse. My hero on a white horse. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these little things that I interject most of them are things that I've gone through myself they involve my own failures and I've, I've failed my share they, they involve my own needs and you know our wants but learning to keep loving him, learning that he keeps loving us, 
No matter what. No matter what. Yeah, <laughs> man. Mike Wallace said, praise God with all the gusto of the hound dog. Anyway, okay, let's proceed. In the drawing, we can see that when God delivers us, he does so by taking away the external troubles and trials. When this happens, our internal suffering is alleviated. The question is, what do we do if God doesn't take away the external affliction? This is where the greatest amount of confusion comes to the believer. Most of us know how to ask for deliverance, and we know that God can do it. When he does not deliver us, we feel lost. We need to learn to trust the Lord, even when he doesn't deliver us. Escaping from the external problems of life is not always the answer. Job was a man who was no stranger to affliction. He said, though the Lord slay me, yet I will trust him. In Job 13, 15. Even if his affliction was unto death, Job would trust the Lord. Most of us lose our trust in him when he doesn't deliver us, and some go as far as to curse him. Anybody want to comment on any of that? Or anybody on Zoom also? Though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. Hmm. Yeah, don't you? Oh, they, they can hear you. Go ahead. Just like the prayer when they got thrown in the fire. We know you can deliver us, but if you don't, we're not bound down. That same. Spirit. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. What is so funny is I wonder with those three Hebrew children, I wonder when they said, you know, um, we, our God is able to deliver us, but uh, if he doesn't, we will still trust him. Um, I wonder if at that moment they thought that that was the height of things spiritually in that situation. But was it? No. See in Jesus. No, no, no. See in Jesus in there with you in the flames. Seeing him on the cross for you. Bringing us into incredible realities in his resurrection. Hallelujah. I just thought of this one too. Um, uh, the Bible says, I'm trying to think of the exact wording because it's offset from though he slay me, I will trust him. Um, ah, it'll come to me. Mallory, come on. Oh, you're good. Yeah. I think in reference to a comment on what was just read, where it says, um, uh, even if his affliction was unto death, Job would trust the Lord. Most of us lose our trust in him when he doesn't deliver us. And I was thinking, I have an easier time trusting the Lord when there's an immediate emergency right in my face, and it might be really bad or really dangerous, but I need to hear from the Lord right then and follow through. And I'm okay, but it's the ongoing things that mm -hmm. never, ever seem to resolve. <laughs> right. or I That's where my faith starts to... You know, get wobbly when it's ongoing with no resolution. And so, anyway, that's I was responding to. Yeah. Uh, let's share it yeah. Yourself. Got it. Good. Yeah. Hand up. Oh, just. <laughs> Though he slay me, that I was. I was thinking like the New Testament version of that. That you know, a lot of times crying out for deliverance is our flesh or our soul, our unsaved soul. Mm -hmm needing, just needing, God help me through this thing. 
and he's wanting to slay you through this. He's really wanting the death, the circumcision of the cross to avail. And, um, and it's at that moment where you find out, you know, do I really love the cross enough to cleave to it in the, um, the cross of my own crucifixion? Mm -hmm. And is that, um, do I really believe in the cross of my own crucifixion in the face of my flesh being slain? And it's a very practical confrontation, <laughs> you know, and I think that that's more, you know, kind of the heartbeat of, of a New Testament believer saying, you know, Lord, you're using this to enforce what you did on Calvary. You did it, but it's, it's you know, that proverbial eternal verb, am crucified, is trying to be real in me right now, but my soul is crying out, my flesh is crying out, my carnal mind is crying out, but can my spirit... Um, what about your pet demons? Yeah, you know, those demons. <laughs> my familiar spirits are crying out. Um, but, you know, just... just just to, to be able to, to stand with your spirit and with the spirit of Christ and say, but I'm going to stay until the death comes to me, not my circumstance gets better. <laughs> that demons are like somebody does you wrong and you, they're being mean to me. That's what he says. And you go, I know. And you pet him and he pets your flesh back. And <laughs> All right. So I thought of the scripture and it says this. What about this scripture? Be ye angry, but sin not. Any comments? What are you afraid that you're, you're sinning? <laughs> you're, I can't answer to that because I'm afraid I'm sinning. Anybody on Zoom want to make a comment? Yeah. Yeah. Um I was thinking of Carrie Ten Boom, and even though she was a Christian, she was locked up as a Jew. And Richard Rombrand in Romania became a Christian in his twenties, and he was locked up for his beliefs. And you know, when Mallory said the ongoing trials, you know, it takes a while to actually believe that this is where you are in this situation, and it's not going to end soon. It's going to be ongoing. And I think. He has grace for those situations, but we have to ask for it. And that's where sometimes I, I fail. I just, I just go, okay, I'll get through it. I believe in you. I believe in you. And that's all about my, my strength. Or else remove it, Lord, remove it, Lord. But I think sort of thank you for this situation, Lord. You know what's going on. Give me the grace to handle it. I think that's where I miss out in my prayer life. And you would know, my dear sister, you've been through some stuff. Um, yeah, I think be you know. I think it's it's almost giving you a free ride there on that one thing. You can be go ahead and be angry, right? You want to come up here since you're not close to a mic. I think that. Um be angry and sin not to me it's angry it can be your like an initial reaction mm -hmm. to something inside outside uh, initial reaction but sin not is where your heart goes wait a minute <laughs> I'm with the lamb I want, I'm going to turn and let's uh, I don't want to sin against the Lord and the lamb as much as within me I want to go with his spirit so be angry but sin not that's what ministers to me what about that scripture that says, don't go to bed angry? <laughs> Married couples. <laughs> yeah. It's a, be ye angry, but murder not. <laughs> Jennifer, did you have something? Or I thought I saw your hand. Of the slay, though you slay me first, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, that's just that's the spirit of Christ. It was in Job in that moment in the three Hebrew children, and that's that spirit that we want at work in us. It's like it's not a trust in the circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's a it's not a that's trust right. in the circumstances or what you can see or touch or. It's a trust in 
the Father and the eternal reality of who He is, who we are in Him, like it's greater. Amen. It's above. And that's something. It is. I want that working here, you know, in me and us. Well, that's it. That's, that's the direction to be conformed to the image of his son, to have that lamb nature of Christ formed in us so that we turn the other cheek, so that we, we love those that persecute us or say anything evil against us. It's just better to be with the Lord, <laughs> you know? I mean, we can make a big mess out of things, you know what? We're like a, what's the old proverbial uh, bull in a china shop or something? We can break a lot of glass. Scott? Well, you know, I was just thinking about the fact that you can, you can love somebody um, and be angry at them at the same time, you know? And I think when we let it leave that realm, you know, um, still loving that person and uh, letting the Lord move through us even when we're angry, that's, that's when we get in trouble. Yeah. If you didn't hear that, Scott said you can love somebody and still be angry with them. It's like this, I love you! <laughs> like, are you sure? <laughs> yes, divide it out. That's just anger. My love is still in that. It's still in that. <laughs> Divide it out. <laughs> All right. Any more, any more questions? Yeah. Or question. no, no. Yeah. Um, we were reading. I was reading this with someone the other. Oh, I thought about it last week too. Just a couple weeks ago, and we we're reading the parable about the woman who wanted justice and would pound on his door, and he wouldn't answer, and he wouldn't answer. And he's like, but the Lord gives the ultimate justice, and if you pound on the Lord's door. And I was like, but I don't want to be that woman at all. Like, I don't want to, isn't the point, there's like a twofold to that. Like the Lord gives the ultimate justice, but also I don't want to be the woman. And the other person was like, well, I don't think the Lord will mind if you pound on his door. I'm like, that may be true, but like, why are you pounding? Are you pounding on that door because you want him or because you want justice? Because if it's a second, he might not answer you for your own sake, for the world's sake, for everything that's happening, all the death within you. But I was just been thinking about that with this class. Is like I don't want to be the annoying person who's like, hey, hey, that person hurt me. Hey, that person hurt me. Hey, when are you gonna do something about it? Can we fix this now? And it's just like, no, I want to be looking after him. If we ask and he doesn't answer, that's like you said a couple weeks ago. That's his answer. Okay. Good. Yeah. It's good stuff. Well, it's a shame we don't have Mr. Gentry here with us tonight. He's packing up and. He and his wife, and they're going to go to Colorado to visit with his grandson and family there. Uh, okay, let's read some more. Okay, let me find most of us. Okay. We... We stated that our reaction to external trials can make them can make them internal trials as well. We become fretful over our trouble. But God's answer to us is not always to do away with the external trial. One of the biggest problems of all is the problem of how to cope with and overcome when the affliction is not externally removed. To continue the disciples had this problem. Jesus and the disciples were at sea in a small ship when a severe storm came upon them. Jesus was asleep. His response to the storm was rest and assurance. The disciples' response was fear. The storm was not only on the sea, but also in the disciples' hearts. Taking away the external storm would not be the ultimate answer to the problem. Even though Jesus calmed the external storm, it didn't solve the internal problem. Throughout the raging storm, Jesus was calm. The storm itself brought out the storm of fear and unrest in the disciples. 
Jesus knew that neither he nor the disciples would drown, for he knew God's greater purpose. Had the disciples known this, they too would have been calm throughout the storm, and this terrible trial would have been a minor discomfort. I just wrote that in there because I got so much from uh, Isaac's sermon the other day. <laughs> no, the, there's a number one. One of the things that I'm really being blessed by, hope you can still hear me, and, <clears throat> is that most of us are, are saying that we're, you know, yes, we have all these things and we have you know, anger at times, or we have hurt, or we have all this stuff. But most of you are saying that you're not, you're not just wanting out of the situation. You're wanting the Lord. You're wanting the nature of the Lord. You're wanting life, real life, God's life in His Son that He gave to us. <clears throat> and where would we be if He hadn't have given us that life? We would just have to deal with everything ourselves. I mean, I've often thought over my years, look around, you know, in this world and think, how do some of these people live without having Jesus as their life? My God. Yeah. You know, it's just, but, but anyway, so it's a blessing to me and I believe, you know, a blessing to each of you that you're hearing one voice, one heart. We want Jesus and and we want Jesus to be able to, you know, uh, like as he was saying, I don't want to stand there and lock, knock and knock and knock. Jesus going, you know, you're really irritating, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you. I'm going to help you. <laughs> um, he would never say that. That's, that's just me. Um, so there was something else that we just said, I thought. Oh, yeah, about the storm. Oh, what I was thinking when uh, Jennifer was reading that, uh, when it starts off, it says something about the disciples, that, that this is, um, the disciples had this problem. And I looked around the room, I said, I know we do. <laughs> we do, yeah. you know. There's nothing to be ashamed of, you know, I mean, and it's not just holding on to Jesus, it's holding on to one another. Because that's a member of Jesus' body, and that's a member, and that's a member, and that's a member, and over there on Zoom, and all the way around, that's a member of Jesus' body. And we are the today disciples. Think about it. So there was a storm way back then and Jesus didn't get freaked out. And um, he stayed calm. And we're the today disciples where storms come up. And Jesus is still with us, what, yay, inside of us in dwelling his body, us. And he doesn't get freaked out, you know. You, you never see Jesus running around on the inside of you say, abandon ship, abandon ship. <laughs> this, one's, this one's life is too bad. <laughs> you don't see that. You see faithful and true, you know. And uh, so... Sometimes when the storm comes, when it seems like, you know, Jesus is not answering, maybe he's asleep in the boat. Amen. And maybe he's asleep because he knows it's going to be all right. I mean, and then we're given the same opportunity that those disciples were to, to trust him, to find him in those situations, to find him there, to, he didn't, you know, he didn't, you know, when, when whoever, Peter or whoever woke him up said, you know, Master, carest thou not that we perish? 
You know, Jesus didn't say, I have not had any sleep <laughs> for, for, you know, a month with you guys. You know, he gets up, he deals with it. I wonder if he laid back down and went to sleep. Anyway, that's, yeah. It's a faith verse that the Lord's been trying to cultivate into my heart. When I'm, cause I, and I say that because of what we just read about the disciples and the right. internal trials being kicked up and maybe mm -hmm. even the externals resolved and the internals just like got to leave its own or just kind of keeps going or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I'm thinking, man, I need the Lord. I, want, I, I need the Lord. The Lord said, well, this is why I gave you this verse today to meditate on. And it's uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and it says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. You just see the unsearchable riches of Christ just being imparted and parted. It has nothing to do with how you feel or what the circumstances are or how well you've done. It's just, he's just going to be that well. If we just believe and not believe even the internal whatever. I just love that verse, all the all and sufficient and abound, just mm -hmm. repeating over and over. You know. I believe the circus is going on in the brain. Yes, Jennifer. So, uh, just a real quick body example that you can have an injury in a part of the body and almost immediately the, book, the body begins repairing. The mitochondria show up and they start repairing, like if there's a tear in the muscle or anything. It's, the body is amazing at how quickly God designed it to just go to work on fixing that thing. And you can actually have a tear or something healed, but an inability to move because there's a neurological process where the, the brain is going to protect you know, the body from further injury. And so I see clients that come in, they can't move, but there's really not any damage anymore. Right. But, but the, you know, it's like you have to be convinced, your mind has to, you know, and so you have to bypass some of those mechanisms to get movement back and get, you know, it's, anyway, it's just a really interesting thing that that can happen in the body where, you know, the external trial is over but you still have something, a mechanism that's keeping you trapped for what it's worth. Jennifer's kind of like the Lord. You come in and you say, oh, my ankle, my ankle. And then she starts working somewhere else. You go, my ankle, my ankle. And she goes, <laughs> and he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. All right, Jennifer, your turn. A good example of the fact that the inner problem must be eliminated is shown by Israel upon leaving Egypt. While in Egypt, they were in bondage to the Egyptians. Whatever the taskmasters told them to do, they did it because they were slaves in bondage. Notice that they cried unto the Lord to remove their external affliction, and he did. They came out of Egypt and bondage, free at last. They sang and praised God for delivering them, but even with the physical, external bondage gone, they still had the spirit of bondage. Mm -hmm. They wandered in the wilderness, tempting and provoking the Lord. They needed a set of laws that would tell them what to do, for they were accustomed to being told what to do by their taskmasters. Every time a problem arose, the bondage that they felt within also rose up. They always demanded deliverance. They murmured against God about their circumstances and about their leader. No matter what state they were in, they were never content. Their internal bondage to their troubles and trials was so overwhelming at times, they thought it would be better to return to Egypt. At least in Egypt, they had some security of knowing the kind of trials they would suffer. They were still in bondage, needing not only external deliverance, but also internal deliverance. Our attitude towards the trials that come our way will decide whether or not we suffer internally.
Um, I remember when, when I was in Bible school, one of my teachers made this statement. They said, they said the, the problem with Israel in the wilderness and one problem after another, after another, after another, was, you know, you, you, could, you could take them out of Egypt, but you couldn't take Egypt out of them. And that stuck with me because, um, well, when I was when I was down in Houston uh, doing that wedding, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of people there, and the the after party went till forever, one o'clock, and and uh, so I was standing around with a bunch of different guys, uh, family members mainly on on Chad's side, Bryce's side. And uh, one, of the, one of the men, a 60-year-old guy, and he was, um, he was struggling with memory loss due to alcoholism and the other effects that go along with that. There's a uh, young guy, and then there was his son standing there, and they were all talking, and so they, they said, well, you're... Pastor, what do you think? And, and I said, you know, kind of like what I'd mentioned just a little while ago, that people tend to focus on the symptoms. The symptoms. Because that's usually what's hurting the most, but that's maybe not the problem. And so I just went into that and started talking about, you know, that, that there are, you know, that... Um, uh, the way that many people try to, and I'm just using this, this as an example, but the way many people try to help an alcoholic is they identify their symptoms and then they work on that. And they're working on that. But you change the symptom, you still haven't changed the problem. You know? And, um, and, and so I was explaining this to him. And uh, I said, you know, usually somewhere in there, because I grew up with the alcoholic parents, and, you know, <laughs> it's was, it was pretty rough. Um, usually behind that, there is some hurt or some situation that has really gone deep into that. And it's producing those symptoms, but it's usually not, not what you think it's going to be. It can be something really, and this is uh, uh, all these years in counseling, uh, it can be something way away that you would never look at, never think of, never bring up, never, you know. Um, and so I was saying, you know, that it just takes time to get past the symptoms and make them want to open up past the symptoms until they're, you know, usually the, to a place to where they feel freedom and, you know, the, the safety, all those kind of things. And, um, and the, the son uh, was, was about to interject something and the father that we were kind of talking about and talking to so hold it, hold it up. He's on to this. this. He's right. This is, you know, he's going, I, you know, I know there's something deeper inside. I might even know what it is. But he, he wanted to stop the conversation from getting off of what the real thing that God could do. And so um, uh, we can have situations um, we can have a situation with a brother or sister in the church. And, you know, they, whether we realize it or not, they re remind us of, you know, somebody in high school that used to, or, or, or your mom, the way she used to do so-and-so or whatever. And, and uh, but there, you know, there's this anxiety, but also this, you know, 
bad feeling towards the member of the body of Christ in that situation because it just reminds you of something else. And it can hurt or it can make you mad. Um, and so, I mean, in, if nothing else in this class, it behooves us to listen to what we're, we're saying. <laughs> Notice I didn't say what I'm saying, what we're saying. Because I believe the Lord is uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses um, saying some things that can go deeper than just the external. Uh, what they call it? Uh, uh, external trials. Um, and move into not even the external, not even the symptom response, but the actual real deal. And uh, so please be in prayer along these lines. Um, I, I just felt like we needed to uh, stop there. I think we can still go a little bit longer, so. What chapter are we on right now? Is it even a chapter? We're still on chapter, chapter one. one. Okay, how would you like to read all the way through here to there without me saying anything? I would <laughs> like to see that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> um, Paul told believers who were slaves and servants to abide in the same calling that they were called. Obey. Oh, wait, wait, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> I just wanted to see what your response was going to be. Randy, will you stop? <laughs> Obey your masters and do not. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and do not worry that you are a servant. <laughs> For the true state and calling you have is as God's free man. Thank you, Lord. There's verses there. 1 Corinthians 7, 20 through 23, and Colossians 3, 22 through 25. Here were men in bondage to external affliction, but Paul tells them that they can live above and overcome their trials, not through an outward deliverance, but through an internal deliverance. Let us consider Joseph, who was placed in bondage through no fault of his own. His own brothers treated him shamefully and sold him into Egypt. He was in the same situation, place, and bondage that Israel was in. We hear no cries for deliverance from Joseph, for God had something greater planned for him than just an exter external deliverance. One day he would not only be delivered, but he would reign almost as high as Pharaoh. What if he'd prayed for and received deliverance when he first went into bondage? He would have missed God's plan and purpose. It's possible to do such a thing. Remember Lot's wife? She was totally delivered from her external affliction in Sodom and Gomorrah, but because of her internal bondage, she looked back and she was turned into a pillar of salt. God's purpose and plan may not always be to deliver us when we get into trouble. Joseph never asked for external deliverance, but he was God's free man, Genesis 37 through 41. He was free from internal bondage, affliction, and suffering. Joseph turned to the source of his affliction and suffering, his brothers, and told them that they intended this for bad, but God intended to use it for good. A minor affliction is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. When we see beyond our troubles into the very purpose and plan of God, there is no chance of being lost to his will. But if you faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Proverbs 24.10 So we must trust the Lord, as the scriptures say. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Psalms 112.7 We must trust him to deliver, and we must trust him when he doesn't. In the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, we see a picture of both. Hebrews 11:32 through 35a tells of those who subdued kingdoms, stopped the mouths of lions, escaped the edge of the sword, and received their dead raised to life. 
These obtained external deliverance. On the other hand, we have Hebrews 11, 35b through 40. These scriptures tell of those who wouldn't accept deliverance. They were tortured, mocked, scourged, imprisoned, stoned, and more. They had external affliction and internal deliverance. They had learned the purpose of troubles and trials and therefore were able to cope and even live above their trials. We must learn to seek deliverance from God, and we must also learn to live with affliction. The prophets and apostles perform miracles for the deliverance of multitudes, but in the end, they were beaten, stoned, and even beheaded. Jesus was delivered from the hand of Herod, and he also suffered the death of the cross. Whether deliverance or affliction, both have their place in the overall plan of God. We must find and understand his eternal purpose in Christ, which will bring about the right response from us. We made it. This is your book, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> one good thing is there's a lot of scripture in here. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. So that it's not... You know, I mean, my stupid name may be on here, but it's not anything. It's what God says in his words. That's what you listen to. That's what you, you pay attention to is his word and his heart. He's trying to communicate his heart. And then one of the other ending things I just wanted to say for this go round, and I'm proud of us for getting through a whole chapter. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> uh, is that um, the lamb is central to all of this. And John the Baptist, when he was baptizing people and he was serving the Lord and he, you know, he testified of the Lord and everything. But on that particular day, he saw the Lord for who he was. He saw he was the Lamb of God. And he didn't just say, you know, uh, look, there's the Lamb of God. I mean, he said something that caused some of his very own disciples, his own people that had joined with him in his ministry to go after the Lamb. And I tell you what, I would give up everybody if we all just went after the lamb. You know, I so love Jesus and his nature, and I want him to be fulfilled in me, to be fulfilled in me, and to be able to break through whatever walls or whatever you know, struggles that will come my way. And so this early writing, I don't, I don't know if I talked a lot about the Lamb, but folks, the Lamb is our nature. That's the nature of Christ, and that's the one who's seated on the throne. Seated on the throne forever and ever, as though he had been slain, a Lamb. Um, but this is the heart of it. And so it, it's not just figuring things out so that we don't struggle or pray away everything. It's allowing the Son to manifest himself in earthen vessels to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this time together. Thank you for these comments. Thank you for this, the attendance, so that we can gather as one body with one heart and, and let you know we love you and we love your son. So continue to have your way in us 
as we walk this path together to have an increase of Christ in us. In Jesus' name, amen.